Although some of you have gone internationally already, you've heard this before, buckle your seat belts, put the tray in the upright position, and hang on. Um, <clears throat> we've got a lot to cover uh, in an attempt to um, <clears throat> somehow land. Uh, and <clears throat> I'll, uh, I think I'll, I'll, one of the things I've been noticing of late uh, with a lot of the journals I've been reading is there are a fair number of people that are overwhelmed with uh, how awful they are. Nobody's found the rat hole of shame here at all, apparently. Um, <clears throat> you know, the one thing I would remind you guys of is that a lot of times we won't really look for other options uh, in terms of changing things unless we run out of all of our usual ones and finally decide that they're not enough. Um, <clears throat> our tendency is to look at a problem and uh, uh, basically tried to change it using the same methods that got us into that problem in the first place. That's usually the, the, the problem, right? It isn't so much the problem we're in, it's the methods we use to get there. The same thing is true with what we're talking about in this class. Is <clears throat> We're looking at shame, we're trying to put together a composite picture, if you will, of the, the characteristics of pure glass people. And the thing I, I don't want you to miss, particularly with the subject we're going into today, is that I, I made the distinction when we started this class, or at least the subject matter, that there is a difference between reformation and transformation. Most of the people that started this class, everybody virtually, all tried to endeavor making the changes by ref reforming things rather than trying to be transformed. And I made mention to you of the fact that transformation requires time, it requires trust, and it requires freedom. And that, that's a, the, the backbone of this whole thing. So you have the freedom to continue on the way you've always gone and trying to change shame the same way you've always, always done. And you will end up getting the same results you've always gotten. Or you can figure out and slowly begin to grasp the idea, that, like I said to you before, that grace creates this space for us to own our humanity enough to actually change it and do something differently, not do the same thing. You know, you all, you all probably know the definition of insanity from AA, <clears throat> doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. That's oftentimes what we do when we start getting aware of something's really, really wrong. And, and I think almost to a person in all the journals I've read and, and uh, other things that I've, that I've uh, walked through with people and talking about it is that, that we're, we're there, right? So we, we spent some time looking at and talking about the, the, uh, the idea of truth and big T and little t truth and, and the realities that are part of our existence, not only internal realities, but external ones. And then we also looked at, at uh, control versus trust. And that's where we left off at least a year ago before spring break. So <clears throat> um, where we're picking up is an extension from that um, when we're talking about control. And what we're talking about is this. I told you, if you didn't buckle up, <laughs> because somehow we've gotten a strange notion about being a good Christian as being a perfect one. Uh, or better yet, just being a Christian at all as being a perfect one. Because we bear the reputation of Christ, we, we bear the reputation of Christianity, and because of that, we don't want anybody to think otherwise. Now, that doesn't sound at all familiar when we're talking about the, the whole idea of control, right? I don't want anybody to think that this is what Christians are. Unfortunately, the more we think that way, the more we act that way. The very thing that we're trying to avoid. So, <clears throat> I introduce it. <clears throat> let, me, uh, <laughs> let me pray, because we're going to need it going through this stuff. Let's pray. Father, thank you for a night's rest. Thank you for uh, a new start to our day. And, and I pray that even as we walk in and talk about this subject of perfectionism and, and all that it does to everybody, all, every person in this room is affected by it. 
and we, we land in places that we can manage and control and minimize our level of risk, uh, particularly when it comes to trusting you and what you're up to. And so help us to have the eyes to see what you're up to and, and to participate when we can and trust you when we can't. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so a couple things for you to uh, look at and consider. Uh, the first one is this. Uh, <laughs> When perfectionism is driving, shame is always riding shotgun, and fear is always in the back seat. Uh, and and that, that's kind of where we start. Man, that is really washed out. Is that washed out back there? Can you? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and that's, that's really the anatomy of the, the journey that we're on when we're talking about perfectionism is the engines that, that are driving it. So in light of that, let me, let me let you listen to, and some of you may have already seen this clip of um, Brene Brown. She did an interview with Oprah, and she's talking about this very subject. Um, so let's listen to that. Oh, don't do this to me. <clears throat> there we go. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> maybe. What emerged for me in the data was that perfectionism is not about striving for excellence or healthy striving, which yeah. I'm for. Yeah. It's a cognitive behavioral process, a way of thinking and feeling that says this. If I look perfect, do it perfect, work perfect, and live perfect, I can avoid or minimize <clears throat> shame, blame, and judgment. You know what I thought when I was reading this? I had another aha, aha. People. <laughs> this was my other aha. That perfectionism, I never gotten this before until I read this, that perfectionism is the ultimate fear that the people who are walking around as perfectionists who have to have everything so yeah. yeah, that they are ultimately afraid that the world is going to see them for who they really are and they won't measure up. There's no question. That, that's what it that's is. That's correct, right? That's exactly okay. what it is. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's fear. Because it's, it's very different than trying to be excellent yeah, and working yeah. hard and doing your best. Yeah. Yeah. And so I call mm -hmm. perfectionism mm -hmm. a 20 ton shield. We carry it around things and it protects us from being hurt. Yeah. But it protects us from being seen. Yeah. And that's, that, that may be old news for a lot of you that have read this. The one thing I would underline for you that, that, uh, that Oprah said, the ultimate fear of being seen as we are and we won't measure up. And actually, I would change that to not necessarily being seen as we are, but being seen as we believe ourselves to be. We, we, we want to, and that's why I talked about control before we got into this, is that our commitment to managing other people's perceptions and our image is very much designed for people to believe us to believe us to be who we're presenting ourselves to be, and that's why the stained glass self is such a big deal when we're talking about it. So let's start with some of the basics here. One, we all experience it. Everybody has some measure of perfectionism in them, particularly in the higher ed ranks. I think when students move higher and higher into education. A lot of times they, they learn, I, we used to joke when I was a graduate student that we were functional perfectionists uh, because essentially we could put it on depending on how picky and, and uh, compulsive the professor was. And so everybody experiences it and we carry it along with us in terms of what goes, goes on within us. The other thing I would comment on is something that you may not have heard, and that is, is perfectionism is actually an internal form of legalism. We don't perform and we are condemned. It's not a matter of we don't perform, I change my behavior and I try again. We don't perform and we're condemned. The worst part about that is, is that ultimately once I'm condemned, I'm always condemned. So how in the world can I possibly do anything good if I'm always in a condemned state? So I'm not given another chance. And it, like I said, it is here, it is a unique form of our own private Phariseeism. Because essentially, Pharisees said, God is so perfect, so holy, we can't possibly reach to his level. So let's try to put a ladder together that would allow us to measure how close we're getting. And so the measure here isn't so much 
whether we're getting there or not, the measure is how perfectly are we doing it. And that's the, the internal Phariseeism and the internal sense of legalism. So the funny thing about it is, is a lot of Christians love to talk about grace, and they spend all of their lives living like legalists. They're not free at all. And, and that part of it is, is the most condemning part, right? Because we're all feeling the same kinds of things here when it comes to this disconnect between how I live, how I handle things, how I handle assignments, how I handle the things that are given to me. And when I don't measure up, that's the point in time that this, this little thing jumps up and bites us. Because then it's the conclusions we make. This is really, in a lot of ways, where the rubber meets the road for, for a lot of what we do. And that's what's important to pay attention to here. Because, you know, if I did a poll on the way out today and asked anyone, all of you, can you be perfect, everyone to a person would say no. But it ain't going to stop me from trying. And, and that isn't going to stop me from measuring myself according to that standard either. Most of us believe catastrophically that if I don't strive to be perfect, then somehow I will be a failure. Or worse yet, I will be mediocre. That's even worse. I mean, it's one thing to be a failure. It's worse to be medi mediocrity. Because we're, we're even more condemned when we're in that state. So we've, we've got to kind of keep it in mind. The funny thing about it is our expectations are part of others' evaluations. So we have our expectations. The funny thing about it is we never ask people what their evaluation is. And, and unfortunately, in a lot of cases, if we ask somebody about their evaluation, they're not going to be honest. And if they are honest and say something complimentary, we discount it anyway. I mean, we, we, we've got a really well-designed little prison cell. And, and we, we keep moving along with it. So why do we do it? She mentioned, Brene Brown mentioned a few of these things. Avoiding rejection, avoiding disconnection. A lot of times people walk around with this latent feeling or belief that if people really knew me, they would realize how much of a fraud I am. So exposure. Despising ourselves before other people do. Now, the funny thing about that is, is that rarely will we ever come into contact with somebody who despises us like we do. Ever. We won't. And the, the funny thing about it is, is when somebody says, I, I take you as you are, I accept you just as you are, and you're saying, oh, you're just saying that. Which is essentially saying to the person, you're lying to me. Now, we'll never say that because that might be a little too offensive. But we'll discount everything they've told us because we're going to hang on to the things that we believe to be true. Um, the other kind of fatal lie in here is that if I strive to do this, this is really the only way that I can experience acceptance and approval from people. The, the generally speaking, and probably in a lot of your groups you've experienced this, is generally speaking, we live in a, in a feedback vacuum. We don't, you know, I, what, you know what, one of the, the most uh, <laughs> confrontive things I, I had said when we were going through safe people is going up to somebody and saying to them, what do I do to push you away and what do I do that draws you to me? And in a lot of cases, we're afraid to ask that question because we think we know what the other person is thinking. And then when they say something that doesn't match what we think, we think that they're just being nice. So we still remain in this state that we've already designed for ourselves. So all of it is driven by fear and, and this, this need to control other people's perceptions of us. This is the, you know, why at the beginning of this class, when I said you're all going to be in small groups, What's the first thought that ran into your head? Well, I don't know these people. How oh, can I trust them? I don't know what they're going to conclude about me if they knew about me the way I do, and I have to tell them everything that I know about myself. It's, it's, it 
pushes on that level of what we can control and what we can't. So <clears throat> what I want to walk you through is, is some differences. Brene Brown said, I, I don't have anything, any beef with striving, with excellence. The beef is with perfectionism. And I want to make some distinctions for you uh, through, through this time so that you can detect when you're lapsing into more perfectionistic tendencies and when you're trying to strive toward excellence. So here goes. This is the first one. Perfectionism usually uses words that are imperative in nature. It should be. It's got to be. It has to be. It ought be. Ought to be. Ought be. Ought to be. <clears throat> it's idealistic. It's creating a target that I can't possibly hit. And, I, and, and again, kind of the strange thing about this is I know that I can't hit it. But I think if I at least shoot for it, I'll, I'll get higher than I would if I didn't shoot at all. See, we think in dichotomous terms. If I, if I don't do this, then I will turn into a failure. I won't accomplish anything. I won't have let anything. Will, will, nothing good will come. Excellence, on the other hand, is living in reality as it is. Remember the, the serenity prayer that I showed you last time, accepting, accepting uh, the world as it is. Now, you say, well, if I do that, then I'm just, I'm just accepting you know, evil, I'm saying, blah, blah, blah. The funny thing about that is the minute we make that argument, we've already given ourselves away. Because we don't want to think. We don't want to discern what's really going on. And being able to discern enough to say yes to some things and no to others. And, and so the absolutistic nature of this idealistic nature of, of perfectionism makes it impossible for us to achieve. And we're always going to get the same results. That's what I said at the beginning. I keep using the same methods and I wonder why I keep getting the same results. They strive for the impossible. The, the realist, the person striving for excellence, still has every bit as high a target as a perfectionist. It's what happens when they don't hit it. They live with the possible. So in a lot of cases, when we're, when we're under some kind of performance you know, uh, pressure, and you won't have any of that at this point in the semester, right? You come down to pr projects and presentations and everything else. And so you, you know, you, you have this great spring break and you get some rest and you jump into the stress of, of the deep end of the pool um, and trying to get through to the end of the, the semester and you have this presentation and you get sick the night before. And you say, I, 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 I still got to do it. I still got to do it. I, so I get up, I do it. I do a, a, a half-baked job because, in my opinion, but I don't even take into account the fact that I'm sick. I don't take into account that I didn't get enough sleep the night before because I have some, a fever or whatever. I, we don't take those things into account. That would be realistic. So I say, all right, well, I'll do the best I can. Well, that's mediocrity, right? The best is what perfectionism is about. Excellence is the best I can because it's limited by the realities that are going on. So motivated by wanting to avoid the negative and a fear of failure, again, people's perceptions. The, the person striving for excellence is motivated by a desire for success and striving for the possible. Did I walk away and do the best possible? You know, the funny thing about it is that if you watch any athletic event or you participate in it, you know, games, even games that are won, are littered with mistakes. And if people quit the game partway through, they would virtually guarantee the outcome. On the other hand, they accept the mistakes that go into it and keep playing and, and win the game. But games are littered with mistakes. I've seen a whole bunch of them for the last two and a half weeks with the NCAA. <clears throat> so here's another set. Perfectionism focused on the product not the process. 
Excellence is about the process. Has, have I put the steps in place, the th aspects of this thing in place, done the best I can with the part of this process that I can? It, and if my answer is yes, usually, usually, if not always, the product takes care of itself. It always does. So perfectionism is about what I can produce. That's why it's part of our culture. Because our culture is about production. Yeah? That's my question and like frustration is how do you function in a culture that is expecting perfection even if they're not saying that? <laughs> yeah, and I you know, I, I think we, we we have to be mindful of the impact that it has. And then the second thing is that I gotta adjust my expectations. Because generally speaking, the people that focus on good process. The, like I said, the product takes care of itself, so it shuts up the critics about the product you put forth. If it isn't up to their expectations, that's a whole different matter, because I may not know what their expectations are. So, you know, I'm, I'm given a, a job or a project, I have to sit down and say, so help me understand what you expect here. And, and just understand that people, they love to cloak their perfectionism, just like we do. So their expectations sound very conditional and very realistic and all this lovely stuff. And usually you can translate it into have to's, got to, should's, this is how it has to be. Because why? Watch how they react when it isn't up to what they expect it to be. So I think in a culture like this, we've got to understand that that's how it functions. But I'm not sure it changes anything about what we do. I, I, the, the culture can't dictate to me what I, t I believe about how I accomplish some project or whatever. And, and that's, that's where we get caught. Because if I want to keep the culture, the people outside of me happy, and I want to try to live graciously, those aren't going to get along very well. So I'm going to have to choose. And am, if I'm going to live graciously, then am I willing to live with the consequences of them not being happy? Because they might not be. Now, you know, I, what, what's the saying up in the School of Business? Excellence is what? Anybody know? Huh? Or competence or whatever is, is kind of our best testimony or something like that. Some cheesy thing up there that they have. Um, and, and to some degree, the beauty of some of those things is there's some truth to them. Is that us striving for excellence and doing the best we can, not be the best because B is about me, okay, but striving to be, be the best that I can will produce more over the long term, if we want to talk in production, over the long term than be trying to be the best all the time. Because I got news for you, there's always at least one person better, which means you can't be the best. Yes, yeah, Sierra. <laughs> Everybody starts in excellence, and they always end up in perfectionism. Like, yeah. They seem like they really intersect like, with they, each other. They do. I, they, there's not, the, the, this is creating a, a false dichotomy here, yeah. just to try to explain it. But absolutely, in the same person, you can have somebody who is striving for excellence in one area of their life. They're willing to live with the reality and all that. And then another area of their life, when they have to answer to somebody who's probably more perfectionistic, they become more perfectionistic. That's why, that's why I said everybody experiences it. Because it is. It is interwoven. I, I think the question is, is what, where, which side of this coin do I spend the most time on, rather than all or nothing? Okay? Um, so the, the expecting the best of myself the best that I can be, expects the best in comparison to everyone else. The fundamentals of perfectionism is built on comparison. It's always there. It's lurking in the background. And because shame is lurking in the background, it views life as a threat. It's something to be conquered. And, and again, the, the, even when I use some of these terms, we, we tend to look at some things as a challenge. There's nothing wrong with seeing something as a challenge or an opportunity. But seeing life as a threat because why? The people in there are not going to come to the same conclusion 
that I want them to, not that I hope, I, that I want them to. And ultimately, for the person striving for excellence, they're, they're looking for uh, seeing life as a challenge. Everything is a challenge. We give it the best shot we can. Notice, notice operational words I'm using, right? We can or I can. It's limited by the circumstances in which I find myself rather than absolutistic. And that's, that's very much a part of what we talk about here. So here's another one. Uh, perfectionism hates criticism. Why? Because it's a threat to your pers personal value. If I'm striving to be perfect and somebody gives me feedback that indicates I'm not, then it's going to be a threat. And I, I don't handle that very well if I'm seeking and uh, driving for perfectionism. On the other hand, somebody that is, is pursuing excellence welcomes criticism. As a matter of fact, they invite it. And criticism doesn't mean, you know, um, brutal, ruthless de destruction of the person. It's inviting criticism to say, help me, help me do this better. I, I'm not sure I can. And in a lot of cases, we don't ever get in this boat where we invite that kind of feedback because it, it's hard. It, it really pushes on, against our demands against ourselves about being this perfect person that we know we can't be, but we're striving to be. Yeah, Kylie. I think like I'm like somewhere in the mix of that. Mm -hmm. It's like I always want feedback, but it's to the point where I want feedback so that I can get perfect. <laughs> more perfect. Yeah, mm -hmm. more perfect. And I think that it like when I can't correct those things, that's when it wrecks me. Yeah. Yeah. Well and yeah, it's not to some degree to some degree it's not like perfectionists never ask for feedback. Your, your example is a perfect example of that. It's just when I, I bump against when I can't, and, and then, then it comes up and bites us. So yeah, you're absolutely right in, in that. So corrects mistakes and learns from them. Most of us have to do this. I mean, you, you could pull a plug on any class at some point, right? But, but you learn from the mistakes and move on. Sometimes we have to go through some measure of grieving that we didn't measure up the problem is, is measuring up to what and whom is, is the bigger question and remembers mistakes and dwells on them. Perfectionists have an incredible memory. <laughs> they love to go over the last time they failed. Uh, think back to that, that clip I showed you of Bruce Almighty. Funny thing about that filing cabinet is that it, it reinforces our notion about how God sees us. We think he's got an entire filing cabinet full of things about us that he's keeping track of. The funny thing about it is it's not God. It's us. We catalog, we index all of these things that we've done wrong and we bring them up at the time when I make a mistake. And a mistake is a failure. So um, <clears throat> another part of this, a few more is uh, uh, values their self by what they do. They do not divorce their value from their production. Now, it's, it never is as clean as that. I mean, it's pretty hard for us, to, for most everybody, to not determine our value by our functionality with people. In other words, how useful I can be. The problem with that is, is that is the basis on which objectification enters into a relationship. Why should I be in a relationship with you if you can't do what I need you to? So we objectify people, I mean, and this is not even a talk about lust or anything like that. We objectify people all the time. Funny thing about it is we objectify God too. It's like, what, what good are you if you can't at least bless me when I do all the right things? See, the same thing enters into our conversation and insidiously sets up a process by which we judge people by what they produce rather than judging people by who they are. So the, the challenge for us is accepting ourselves as we are, not as we should be. If anybody's been in my office, they know where this is going because we'll never be what we should be. It's a target we'll never hit. So, 
what comes out is disappointment, condemnation, frustration, failure, anger, isolation, a lot of different things have come out of the whole perfectionism thing and the way that we go about handling all of it in terms of excellence and seeking excellence. And again, like I said, this is a convenient dichotomy created here. These things are never this clean in any one person. There are some places that I feel secure enough for myself that I, I strive for excellence and I'm good with that. But there are other places where maybe I'm not quite so secure and then I start getting more perfectionistic and I, and I worry and I engage in all, all sides, sorts of minutia that I take, involve myself with or Netflix. Uh, and, and all of that goes into it. So, now let me show you a video again. And this, this one, I think if you guys were in my, my uh, workshop last fall, this will look familiar. But it, it's a video from Acura and they nailed something that I want to remind you of in terms of these, in these thing, in terms of the items that we've been talking about here. Um, and then, and then I, I want to kind of drive it home and we'll then talk about it. So what do I do next? literally stumbled onto a profound truth. Um, there's, there's few commercials you see that there is absolutely no dialogue in. Everything is contained in the looks of what's going on in here. And, and the desire for precision and the desire for doing things well is all portrayed here. Acura does it masterfully. The biggest item is what drives the precision is relationship. It's his family. And so I would, I would change this around to when you don't think of yourself as a dummy or an idiot or stupid or horrible or failure or a loser or not smart enough or not attractive enough, I catch everybody? Something sacred will happen. You, you seek and find grace. One of the things I've been harassing my wife about One, one, <laughs> only one. And that is her language around this, around this. She, she is an expert at shaming herself with her language. So we were in the car driving to church and my daughter, my eldest daughter was with us and she said, have you talked to um, my wife's dad, Pop Pop is his name. And <clears throat> have you talked to Pop Pop? And she said, no, I haven't for all week. And I'm the worst daughter ever. <laughs> and I look over and say, uh, uh, I beg your pardon? <laughs> I'm, I'm not easy to live with, I'm sure. But <laughs> I, I said, maybe you might want to say that a little differently. I, I haven't been able to give him a call. I'll call him as soon as I can doesn't make her the worst daughter or the worst mother or all of those descriptors that I just used. See, our, our tendency, again, don't forget this, is our tendency is to believe that the way to change my behavior is to avoid feeling bad than it is to embrace grace and keep trying. <clears throat> and that's it's a fundamental piece of what we're talking about. So... You're saying, I'm sure, 
All right, you did it again. I'm feeling about as bad as I possibly can by this time. What does the journey look like? Well, it's the journey is between this or this. <clears throat> this is the tree you pick up at Michael's and you paste on a few oranges on it to, and say, look, I got an orange tree. Or that, where you take years to grow and care for and prune to, to, to have it produce a harvest because of all the care that's been given it in terms of cultivation. If we want to move from perfectionism to excellence, it's going to take time. You know where I'm going. It's going to take trust and it's going to take freedom. It still will. It's the same thing over and over again. The time part is the thing we don't like so much. I would much rather go to Michael's, grab a tree, throw on some oranges and say, look, I'm a wonderful farmer. I just have this orange tree in my office. <laughs> Versus taking all that time to learn about pruning and learn about all this other crap that goes with farming. It just takes too much time. So moving, we have to reject our tendency to look for how-to steps or formulas to do it right. Every time somebody tells you something that works for them, all of us parse their words to figure out maybe that's a formula that I can use. Rather than my journey with Jesus is thoroughly individualistic and it's me and him. It's not me, a formula in him. <clears throat> so we have to learn to cultivate rather than demand performance. Does the, does the farmer still perform? Yeah, he does. Does he get it right every time? Does his pruning work every time? Maybe not for things unknown about what's going on in the tree. <clears throat> this goes back to this idea that I said before when we were talking about control is that one of the things we try to control is our pain. And I said there are three different sources of pain. It's pain from damage, pain from growth, and pain that is simply part of the journey. And that's this kind of discomfort. Because remember, pain isn't a broken leg or a broken arm or anything like that. Pain is the same of just feeling uncomfortable. And expect discomfort. Because it, it's not anything worth having is going to be hard. We, we don't really like that formula very much. But we have to reject comparisons. And we always have to ask, what are my expectations? Because generally, when I experience disappointment, it's not because of the other person's behavior. It's because I, my expectations were out of whack with what was possible at that point in time. I, I don't, you know, I, I, I sit down with people all the time and, and I never know what they're going to uncork when they walk into my office, hence why I have a Kleenex box. <laughs> I have stock in Kleenex. But I, I, I don't, I, I have hunches, but I don't have expectations much anymore. Uh, people can, can choose what they want and whatever. And, and that, that aspect of it then means what? A lot, of, a lot of times people will say something, whatever it is, and, and they are sure that I am disappointed. And it isn't, that couldn't be farther from the truth. Couldn't be farther from the truth because it's not about me. It's their disappointment projected onto me. But I, that just isn't so. And so can I still be disappointed? Of course you can. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not precluding that at all. Because what are we disappointed with? We're not disappointed with people. We're disappointed with outcomes. When things don't turn out the way we want them to, it's disappointing. And that, I, that, okay, that's, that's part of being human. Some more. Keep an eye on your impatience with others. Your expectations... Uh, that you have imposed upon others is a lot of times where that impatience comes from. Growing in grace is a lifelong journey. It is not a skill to master. Which means that I'm, I'm getting there is probably the more realistic thing. Most of us, again, kind of humbly say those kinds of words. I'm getting there. I'm making progress. Okay, <clears throat> but
But if I'm evaluating myself perfectionistically, then really progress is irrelevant. It's whether or not I produced what I needed. <laughs> Finding other recovering perfectionists. You can, in every class, you're littered with people that are perfectionists. There are only a few that are actually recovering. Because a lot of times they don't have the information you've, you've gotten. We, we, we make this comparison, realistic comparison, against where we are and where we want to be. Not where I should be, but where I desire to be and move toward that end. People that are recovering perfectionists are really good at helping each other catch themselves being perfectionistic. Not to heap shame, but to say a little bit like my wife. I, I know that she's not going to change her language overnight. I know that. And it's kind of a humorous thing because, you know, I, I, she can read me like a book. Forty years will do that. And, and I'll grip the, the steering wheel a little tighter, or I'll look over with a side eye or a stink eye, and she'll say, oh, yeah, I did it again, didn't I? Yeah, you did. Okay. Give it another shot. <clears throat> Learn to accept God's acceptance of you and beware of self-condemnation. Acceptance is a problem for most of us because we want to work for it, and therefore we don't feel indebted. But the acceptance has already granted us. Uh, <clears throat> the power of grace. And I, we've been spending the whole semester trying to unpack this whole thing. But the idea that it's a free gift, it doesn't have to be earned. It can't be. What happens when we try to earn it? I would say we insult the gift giver. That's not a matter of shame. It's just recognize that for, for a minute. <clears throat> and so... The idea of seeing our own need, engaging the process in terms of strength and change and seeing the outcome. Will I immediately see an outcome? Probably not. Probably not. And, and we're tempted, we'll, as with anything, that at the first few days we have all of this energy and motivation and we're striving toward some goal and we say, I'll never make it. I'll just never make it. Because why? We don't see enough results early enough. In a lot of cases, for anything that's going to be a long-term process, it's not going to be immediate results. In our minds, we can grasp that, but our hearts are saying, this, this just is too uncomfortable. I'll, I, I think I'll bail at this point because it, it, it's too much pain, and that prompts us into control. See, these things interweave with one another all the time. They're, they're a part of, of the landscape of how we function and part of, part of a, like I said, kind of part of a class like this is the challenge of, of, of kind of forcing you to walk around the landscape of your heart and do an assessment of what's going on there. Not to, not to condemn it, not to condemn it at all, but to be clear about what parts need more care, more cultivation. Um, <clears throat> So some, some messages of grace that we can reiterate along the way. I don't always have to measure up. No one is perfect. It's coming from the message in Romans 3.23. I never have to lose God's love because of anything I might or might not do. That may not sound from your translation, but it is a paraphrase of that. What Paul intended to say. I can't stop comparing myself to others because God designed me to be unique, a one-of-a-kind person, Psalm 139. We use that verse to have the, the wonders of who we are, and yet we'd, we lose sight of that very, very quickly. And I'm free to enjoy life. God doesn't want me in bondage to a set of rules and regulations. And that's Somehow we, we've gotten this notion, and I, I you know, again, I'm, I'm, I'm me too. There's no stones being thrown here. But somehow we get the notion that if we have fun, something's wrong. <laughs> that somehow if we're, if, and, and when you look at it, I mean, putting it in a modern context and look at Jesus' ministry, one of the first places he came out as God was at a party. And what did he create? Wine! <laughs> Let's have a party. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I, that, there's, there's, we've gotten to be almost puritanical sometimes about how we tend to deal with life. 
is really the only way to do it, is to be serious-minded, always on top of things, always producing, always notice all the imperative words, always. And guess what? I've set myself up to fail again. So <clears throat> Jesus was the reflection not only of God himself, but he was also the reflection of God's heart for us, too. And that's every bit as important as anything else that we might, might be looking at. So, all right, now let me, let me stop for a second um, and see what reactions or questions you guys have. What's next? I have another installment of Boundaries for you. Um, so, uh, let me hear your, your reactions, questions to this material that you've heard. Yeah. So I think like at least for me like a lot of times when I feel like I've failed at something. Like I feel like I have to react in a way that like makes it know that like I know I have like failed. Show people that you fail? Like that I feel bad. So you feel bad for failure. Yeah. Like what what do you because I feel like it's just like to fail at something and then to walk away at it and be like, oh it's it's okay. I'm gonna do my best. <laughs> yes. That's not accepted. I mean, I think like right. especially in athletics, it's just like where I'm specifically thinking of right. to walk away from something, not have achieving like what I'm supposed to achieve. Like, what are you doing yeah, well, I think I think when we pull away kind of this the veneer, the whole perfectionism thing. You said two things. All right, I didn't do as well as I had hoped, and that's okay. This is. This is an attempt to manage this. I didn't perform at the levels that I had hoped I would. It feels, it sucks. I don't like that, period. But I don't have to add in, but that's okay. Or because, I, again, we tend to counterbalance these things. And generally speaking, when you look at uh, people that are accomplishing lots of things, they live with a lot of mistakes. But they don't say it's okay. They say, all right, let me look back. You know, why, you know, for all the athletes, why do we have game film? We go back looking for what? Everything you did wrong, usually. Not the things you did right. But the reality is, is why? To learn. To learn. If I say, but that's okay, now I'm adding a whole nother layer onto that and saying, something I don't even believe. It's not okay. I don't like how I perform that way. Do I have to accept it? Well, I have to accept that that's what happened, but I don't have to accept it for the future. I, I work harder and do something differently. It, 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 that, that's a good part of that, I think. So our, our, our tendency, the thing about our language, and I've said this, and a lot of you guys have had me in class before, and I've said this, is that our language betrays how we think about things. The language we use does. So our perfectionistic, absolutistic, overly demanding, you know, all of that betrays how we tend to think. And one of the annoying parts, I'm sure, of being around me is I catch that stuff. Most of you collude with each other to blow past that stuff. But that stuff betrays how you think. And so it's not a magic bullet just to change the language. That's not going to change anything. You'll just do that perfectly, too. Or you understand that if I can, if I can start changing how I frame things, not magically, but begin to do that, before too long, it begins to infiltrate my thinking because I'm having to think through something. See, we reflexively are absolutistic and demanding, reflexively. And, and so we have to find a way to slow that process down. And language is just one way. It's not every way. I mean, I, I've got to do some things differently, clearly. But there's a lot about perfectionism that's all head stuff. And, and that's the problem. It's all head stuff. It's not about the heart and what my motivations are, which is what I'm trying to unveil here, <clears throat> is what are my motivations that drive along this perfectionistic kinds of assumptions and, and conclusions and everything else. I don't have to set myself up. 
I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a far cry from where I was when, when, I'm, I was you, when I was sitting in your seat. I had absolutistic, perfectionistic expectations. Your, my wife, who, was, who I was dating at the time, would tell you every semester I said I was going to make the dean's list. And every semester I failed. Every semester I failed. I'm not overstating it. I'm not. I graduated with a stunning 2.99. So perfectionism didn't work very well. And, and procrastinating and putting off things until I have enough pressure for me to feel like I need to get something done. Nobody feels that, right? Here's a little tidbit. You want to define pro pro procrastination? It's, your, it's being a, a passive aggressive with yourself. You say, I gotta get this done, I gotta get this done. And there's some little voice in me saying, I'll be damned if I'm gonna do that. <laughs> Nobody's gonna boss me around. <laughs> oh, forget about the fact that it was me. Oh, how do I get out of that? Yeah, Netflix, next. <laughs> yeah, I listen. <laughs> or read, whichever you prefer. So, any other questions, thoughts? Yeah. That's a novel idea. Yeah, I mean, the, the reality is, is we're always going to be in a culture, always. So if, if you're right in saying the stuff that we're talking about is so completely countercultural, then, then, I mean, a lot of times people will equate that with saying, well, Christianity is countercultural. Well, yeah and no, because the people that are enacting Christianity look like everybody else anyway. So, really, if what's going to be really countercultural is how we think, it's not always going to be our behavior. It's how we frame something and understand something that leads to certain behaviors that are really very free. Which, I, you know, in a lot of cases, remember what <laughs> Brene Brown says, you know, I, I admire your vulnerability and I'm repulsed by mine. That same thing is true for courage, is I admire your courage. But I, I'm scared spitless about mine. So there's, there's more to this than meets the eye. If we keep our eyes out on the culture, waiting for it, not necessarily that way, but waiting for it to, to applaud, that chance. <clears throat> so either I'd be free or else I hold myself hostage to the culture I'm in and, and try to do it, thread the needle. And I, I'm, I'm not very good at threading a needle. So. Yeah, it's, it's, it's be free in a lot of these cultures we live in. Is, I mean, it's, you will be condemned. Yeah. And you will fail and you will not mm -hmm. measure up to the expectations. Um, yeah. And? And? Therefore, what? Well, uh, yeah, if I'm going to stu but if I'm going to hold those expectations and everything equal to the values I'm trying to live out of free, free and responsible, it's not just free and, you know, licentious, but being free, then I can't have it both ways. On the one hand, I'm going to be 
held by that, and then I'm going to take that and apply it to what I'm doing, or I'm going to live here, and they, they, they can do whatever they want. You know, it's like, whatever. Okay, we're done. Bye.